record. So welcome to week eight. It's amazing. You're almost done with your second to last quarter for most of you. I mean, you've got one more quarter when you're done. It's, uh, it goes quick. Now, this week is a lot of work. So please just do your best that you can. Um, when we look at this week's work, you have NFLEX questions due. You have diabetes and the pediatric assignment exam case studies. And you also have a clinical pediatric assessment project. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this project. It is 6% of your subjective grade. It is three components. Number one, choose a topic that can be considered a pediatric subject. Uh, I always suggest you know, choose something that maybe you had or your child had or your sister or your next door neighbor or someone at school, something that you wanna know more about, okay? If you're unsure if that diagnosis is something that you can use, you know, send me a message and I can tell you it's a good one or maybe do it like this instead, okay? So pick a, t a subject that really interests you. The second thing, is you're gonna write a 250 word APA. Tell me what is this diagnosis? What is it, okay? Very simple, very quick, brief, concise to the point. Then I have sent you a, a Word document attached to the announcement because in your modules, there's a PDF. Some of you, and I'm not saying all of you, but there's always a couple who cannot change a PDF to a Word document. So I made sure you have a Word document too that you can write on, save it and send it back to me instead of trying to work with a PDF because you don't know how to do it, okay? So that's why that's there. On this assessment, tell me what your child would look like with the diagnosis that you chose. I don't wanna hear normal, normal limits. I want you to tell me what does a heart sound like? What does a lung sound like? If it's an asthma patient, I want you to tell me what an asthmatic child having an asthma problem would sound like. You know, they're wheezing, rechecting, flaring, grunting, whatever, okay? So make sure it's specific. And the uh, third thing that you're going to do is something about teaching. Now, I have actually, when I was doing clinicals on ground, um, I would actually teach sometimes the nurses a diagnosis that maybe is a very rare one they didn't know about. And the students actually would teach the RNs um, some diagnoses. Because let me tell you, there's so many, you're not gonna know all of them. You know, I've been a nurse for 40 some odd years and I still don't know all of them. So it's nice, you know, to learn so we know what to look out for. But I mean, in this case, you're probably gonna be teaching the child or you're gonna be teaching parents or both. Now, you could do it in a couple different formats. Most students chose a PowerPoint. Now, the PowerPoint, five slides is more than enough. Tell me, maybe it's teaching on an asthma patient. Tell me about how to use a spacer or tell me pre preventatives or what medications work, how to work with a child with asthma and make their life normal. Okay, five slides. That's all I need. Or give me a brochure, give me information about it. Or you can just do a picture page, you know, one page about, you know, telling me about asthma. The only thing is put a reference on your teaching. And I request two references. That's all. I know your book is number one, always use that. And then number two, something else. So if you are worried that your project isn't good enough, send it to me early. I will look at it, okay? Let me know, please check my assignment. I will look at it. I will give you some feedback and I will let you resubmit it to get the best grade you possibly can, okay? Because this is a learning time. This isn't something it's one and done, you know, and it is 6% of your grade. And I want you to get the best grade you possibly can, okay? So when they come up, I'll be looking at them and I'll send you information. 
you want to change it, you do. If you do not want to change it, that's your decision, but I'm going to give the opportunity. Now, the one thing about it, it does go through a plagiarism checker. If it is above 30%, I will tell you, you need to change it. There's, or else I have to report academic dishonesty because of plagiarism. And I don't want to do that to anybody because usually it's because you didn't know or didn't understand. All you need to do is change the words into your own words, change the words around a little bit, and that will stop the plagiarism. Because every time you turn it in and turn it all in through Canvas, because there's multiple, multiple attempts. So you can turn them in as much as you want there, okay? Just return it in and it will go immediately through it again and you'll be able to see it, okay? So you're gonna get the best grade that you want um, and I will work with you with that, okay? So they are due by Sunday. That's the other thing. So you have the, the two case studies, you have the NCLEX question, and you have that pediatric assessment assignment. So it is a lot of work. Now, I will be sending you your um, handout for your exam three by this weekend, because next week, again, we're starting now the review sessions. Okay, and I'll be starting probably the first one on Tuesday, same thing like I normally do. I try to do mine first, get it out to you so you can hear me, and then go hear somebody else, one or two more, just to hear a little bit of a different point of view about them. You know, I do go back and I do look at the other professors' reviews, and actually they're pretty good. And they do describe things a little differently, which can help you understand a little bit better, okay? So that's there. Um, this week, have you noticed, I have turned on your subjective grades. The subjective grades are your homework grades. Now it is 20% of your grade. I have to tell you that this class does have minimal homework missing. You know, and I don't really have to reach out and say, hey, you're missing whatever. It's a rare thing. And, and I appreciate that. So you guys really work hard and I know you do and I appreciate it. So thank you so much. It makes my job easier, but it shows me what sort of nurses you're gonna be in the future. So y'all I believe are gonna be really good nurses because you know, I'm getting old. I'm gonna need somebody to take care of me. I mean, my birthday is Friday. So I'm gonna be 70 years old. So I'm getting old. So, you know, I'm gonna need some youngins to take care of me and, and to help me as I get older. So I know all of you, I'd have any of you take care of me as a nurse. This week, we're gonna go over GIGU. And I did send you a handout. You know, these handouts are so good because in them, you're gonna see those simple little things that you need to remember about these diagnoses. And, you know, you talk about GI, there's so many things in pediatrics that are not in the adult world. So this is gonna help you identify and understand things easier um, and it's all in one place. So and that's why I do those matching things for you. Any questions so far? Okay, let's go on, let's do our PowerPoint. And then we have a cahoots. Um, next week, there is no class. You have two choices. I'm gonna send you a recording from a previous semester or I am going to ask you if you want to go to another class. If you want to attend another professor's class, let me know. I will send you the links so that you can attend something else. We have classes on Tuesday. We have them on Tuesday afternoon. We have them on Tuesday evening. We have them on Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening, and we have them on Friday. Um, afternoon and evening. So just let me know what works for you and I will give you those Zoom links so that you can attend them. Or you can listen to my um, week nine that I already have on my YouTube channel and I'll be sending you that link for you to look at. Remember, I change PowerPoints and the cahoots every single quarter to make sure I'm covering the concepts I'm seeing on HESI's and on exams. So make sure you go back and look for the differences, okay? So I get a three-day weekend for my birthday. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> and I love that. Anyway, GI, GLU, let's start there.
question. If we watch your Zoom, are we doing anything else with it? Like how, like do we have I'll to- I'll be sending you a message and you'll know exactly what to do. Okay. I'm gonna probably give you two questions to talk about. Tell me about something, okay? okay. Yep. Probably something like Duchenne muscular dystrophy. What do you know about it? Or one of those things, okay? Things, and actually what I'm gonna ask you is concepts are always on HESI, are always on NCLEX so that you know, you'll become more familiar with, okay? But thank you for asking that, yes, thank you. So GI, well, when we think of GU and urinary, we think of children, we think of urinary tract infections, most common, common condition that children have. We know girls, there's like a really short distance between their rectum and, you know, their urethra and the way that they wipe and they don't, you know, wipe well or in diapers, they sit in stool. So it goes in the urethra and we know that's why we get frequent urinary tract infections in girls. Now in boys, it is the uncircumcised male. Um, many women I have found through my career, mommies don't like to pull down the foreskin of their uncircumcised male. They think it's going to hurt them. So what happens, it gets a collection of that white cheesy stuff called schmegma, which is like a Petri dish and it grows bacteria, goes in the urethra, and then of course urinary tract infection. They should be pulling it down. I mean, one time you can't pull it down is a condition called phimosis. That's a narrowing, a very tight, you can't pull it. My grandson had that. He, I could not, and let me tell you, I tried. Pulled down the foreskin, it didn't go. So he had to get a circumcision because he would have been in a chronic urinary tract infection because it wouldn't come down. So uncircumcised boys and young girls, they get these urinary tract infections. And um, it's because of, you know, either, you know, the, they don't clean it well or they're wiping wrong or sitting in stool. Now, how do you know your, your kid has a urinary tract infection? Well, an infant, you know, you might see uh, foul smelling urine or maybe a fever. In an older child who is toilet trained, they're gonna be incontinent. They're gonna have like little, you know, accidents, which isn't normal for them. Or you see them, you know, twitching and hurting and rubbing, you know, between their legs because, you know, it hurts and it burns. Um, and again, you might smell it. So when you see that, um, you know that you're looking for that urinary tract infection. So prevention. Well, number one, teach parents what they might see so they know what to do and to catch those urinary tract infections before they become kidney infections. You know, teaching them to clean properly front to back. And actually in adolescence, we teach them if they are sexually active and have had urinary tract infections, one of the ways to help prevent urinary tract infections is to urinate right after intercourse. It's something that does help them prevent urinary tract infections. So we've decided you have a urinary tract infection, what do we need to do? Well, you know, on the exam, you saw the best way with the best results is to do a catheterization, especially on your young ones. And, and let me explain why again. When you have a young child, like the baby in this picture, probably is two months, maybe two, three months at the most. And we just bag that urine and we get maybe contaminants from the skin and we give an antibiotic and it doesn't work. So then they have to come back in. They're still with fever. They're still with infection. It's probably traveled up to their kidneys now. Now they're in pyelonephritis and now you're in more trouble, right? But if we do a simple urinary catheterization, get a really good urine and a good culture, we know that the first time the antibiotic is going to work. And that is better for the infant, okay? The older child, yeah, we'll bag them. That's not a problem. But the younger ones, no, we won't. Now, there are the premature infants that that little catheter is just too big for them. So how are we going to get a really clean urine? We do something called a suprapubic aspiration. So we take a cleaning area, sterile gloves, and use a syringe with a needle. The physician, he'll go down above the suprapubic bone, go straight in, 
and that's where the bladder is. And he'll extract about a eh, half cc of urine is all you need for a culture. And most premature infants are on sedation, so they don't really feel it. Um, but it is just like doing a urinary catheterization, but we have to do it in a different way. We have to go in, you know, with the needle. Sometimes we have to go in, take a aspiration of the kidney itself with that percutaneous tap. Sometimes we'll put a catheter in on older children and put fluid in and take the, the liquid out and try to stir up whatever sludge or mucus, whatever's in there um, to try to get a culture on that. We do ultrasounds. We're going to look for some sort of, you know, structural issues. Um, we're going to do avoiding cystourethrography. It's called a VCUG. That we do on children with frequent, frequent urinary tract infections that are older. And we were looking for, again, structural issues. IVPs or intravenous pyelography. Um, looking for mostly stones in that one. And that's the older, older kid along with those renal scans. So sometimes we have to do a renal biopsy. We want a really good clean urine from the kidney. We want to see what's going on. So how do we take care of it as nurses? Well, these children will be NPO depending on their age, how much before the exam. These are usually older children. So it's usually four to six hours before the test. They'll be getting something to help them calm down, whether it's the happy juice, midazolam, you know, your Versed or, or something to keep them calm and relaxed. They'll be placed on their abdomens and we will um, know that they do stick a needle directly through the back, through the skin, into the kidney and get a specimen. Now, that has opened up a place where urine can dribble out and go into the peritoneum or it can dribble out and go onto a dressing, okay? So we need to have a good pressure dressing on there, but we need to make sure we watch the abdomen because if urine dribbles into the peritoneal area where the kidneys are, it causes some irritation and it'll cause pain. So we know that that puncture wound from this biopsy is oozing. And then of course, if the dressing's wet, we know that too. We will watch and take an output because we've just hurt a kidney by sticking a needle in it, right? These children will be uh, on bed rest for 24 hours. This is a very similar looking thing like to cardiac catheterization, right? We have pressure dressings with a sandbag if we need to, bed rest, and then of course, monitoring um, the dressing, et cetera. As I said, sometimes we have obstructive uropathy um, and that just means it could be on one side, both sides could be multiple areas where urine can't get down um, or sometimes valves are open and then it refluxes up. And those things do sometimes require a surgical intervention. Uh, think about the bladder as a vesicle, okay? A vesicle to hold urine. So it's a vesicle ureteral type of you know, reflux. It means that bladder is putting stuff up into the ureters. And remember the bladder really isn't as sterile as the ureter and, and the kidneys, um, the urine coming down. So it can create a problem and cause problems in the kidney. Okay, our first thing that we talk about when we talk about kidneys, nephrotic syndrome. This is not anything to do with renal failure. This is not renal failure, has nothing to do with renal failure. This has to do with a kidney saying, I don't like you protein and it keeps spitting it out, period. So what do you see? You see the urine full of protein, but not only is the protein coming you know, out in the urine. Remember, there's protein in the blood that is filtered by the kidneys. So you'll have hypoalbuminemia. Protein is albumin, right? So now you've got intravascular that has no protein. So now be really careful with administering medication. It's all gonna be free drug in the, in the blood vascular, okay? Which could cause a lot of toxicity. So you gotta be careful there. Now, but because of this no protein inside the vascular, the interstitial spaces 
the goes out into the extracellular. Okay, so if the vascular goes out in the extracellular and you swell up and you're full of edema just because of the different, like this osmotic sort of pressure, it goes into tissue. You see big puffy eyes and this child's gonna be edematous. So you lost protein and you're gonna see a kid who's swollen with all of this fluid because of the decrease of protein in the body. So their tongues and their gums even get swollen. That's why they don't wanna eat because they're swollen in there, it hurts, okay? They are a risk for infection because the treatment is steroids. What do steroids do? It renders you immunosuppressed, right? So you are gonna be risk for infection. These children, we cannot, because they're swollen, they're edematous. We need to put them on fluid restrictions and salt restrictions. And because they can't overtake fluids, we've gotta be careful with what activity they do. They can't be sweating and using a lot of, you know, energy with fluids because monitoring their intake and output is going to be really, really difficult. So how do we take care of these kids? Well, number one, the family needs support and understanding what's going on. We need to stop that protein from coming out, that fluid from going into the, the tissues. So priority, strict INO and daily weights. Fluid balance in a child is monitored the best with intake output and daily weights. Now we've talked about rheumatic fever, right? It's caused by what? Strep infection, right? Well, this is your second diagnosis caused by streptococcal infections and it's called acute glomerular nephritis. Well, what is glomerular nephritis? Well, glomerular nephritis has to do with oliguria, edema, and hypertension. Well, what does that mean? Well, you stop urinating, so the fluids do what? They stay in your body. So you get swollen with edema. And we know if you have too much fluid in your bodies, you're gonna have high blood pressure. That's part of it. Also, the kidneys are going to start um, putting blood out and protein's gonna also be excreted. So how do we treat a, a glomerular nephritis? Well, let's take care of the strep infection, right? And we know that if we get it in time, that it will be an acute stage of glomerular nephritis and won't be a long-term chronic disease. So that's the way that you prevent that long-term. So what do we do as nurses? We're gonna manage that swelling, that edema, that fluid that they hold on them by managing that edema, by watching daily weights, watching intake and output, but we also, because it has to do with kidneys, we're gonna look at their abdominal girth. In nutrition, like I said, low sodium, fluid restrictions, and be careful, these children are susceptible because treatment is steroids. Now, Wilms tumor, we've heard about it before. It is the African-American child, male, ages three to five. And it is a tumor that comes off of the kidney um, or adrenal gland in that area. And what you see is just a big swollen mass in the abdomen. As I said, I saw one case of this and I had never seen it before and didn't even knew that I knew the name. But when I felt this child from Haiti who came, of course his records were after the Haitian earthquake a couple of years back. I, I, all the records were in Spanish, I mean, in French, so I couldn't read them. So I had to do an assessment and I found this large softball sized tumor in that left lower abdomen. Somehow I knew it was a Wilms tumor and somehow I knew not to touch and palpate the abdomen anymore, which I fed on to the nurses that I had handed them off to when I brought them back in, into a room in the emergency room. Treatment chemo, radiation, one or the other or both, and then they do surgical remover. Now, they do not do a biopsy of this before surgery because it would be just like touching it, manipulating that tumor. It would have metastasized, allowed an opening for that tumor to go into the peritoneal cavity and cause metastasis. So we do not do any sort of biopsy.
So acute renal failure, chronic renal failure. Well, acute, acute renal failure could be due to an obstruction, you know, the ureters got kinked, it's not coming out, one of those things. I've seen acute renal failure due to ibuprofen. Um, you think ibuprofen Motrin is benign. Well, it can cause acute renal failure. Chronic renal failure is usually due to the kidneys not formed right or some other stuff that can go on. Acute renal failure. One of the biggest reasons that it occurs is dehydration. You know, you think dehydration is not a big deal. You just rehydrate. In kids, it can hurt their kidneys and cause them to go into failure. So we don't want to do that. So if we suspect dehydration in a child, we really need to get them rehydrated as quick as we possibly can. Now, chronic renal failure is when they say 50% of the kidneys aren't working. And we know it keeps deteriorating and becomes less functional, less functional, and less functional. Chronic renal failure could be due to those congenital type of deformities, or it could be that we're chronically refluxing polyne polynephrosis, causing you know, infections to damage kidneys, but it could be due to hereditary disorder. Now, I worked at a hospital as a clinical instructor on the GI floor. And I saw that their dialysis room was always full. And I was like, well, why? I, I, don't, I didn't know that there was this many kids. And what the nurses said is, in our population, there is some cultures that marry within cultures. So that marrying within families caused these um, children to have defects. And one of the defects they saw was their kidneys, you know, uh, weren't working properly. So that's what they had told me. It can be due to a chronic glomerulonephritis, or it could be due to, you know, you have an anaphylactic reaction and it hurts your kidneys or lupus. And, you know, lupus affects any organ. So how do we take care of it? Well, we're trying to maintain the best renal function we can. Um, most of the older children are on hemodialysis two, three, four times a week, four, six hours, depending what the physician thinks they need. And of course, we're maintaining those electrolytes and fluid balances in them. Uh, one of the things is they do have chronic low hemoglobin and hematocrits. So as a preventative and to help these children, we give them erythropoietin which is an injection sub-Q that we give usually weekly. And that helps them produce red blood cells so that they'll have less transfusions because the body is doing the best they can. I mean, a chronic renal failure child, you know, is already a slave, if you want to say it, to the dialysis machine. But these kids tried to try to let them be as normal as they possibly can, because they are already, you know, um, dealing with being in the hospital or a dialysis center, you know, frequently. Now, one of the new things they're doing in the adult population is they're starting to do peritoneal dialysis as the first thing um, when they're suspecting, you know, kidney failure. Now, infants, you cannot do hemodialysis because if we did hemodialysis, that blood flow turbulence tends to um, make the fragile vessels in their brains um, burst and they have intraventricular hemorrhages, so we can't. So we do peritoneal dialysis. Now peritoneal dialysis in the children, it's done at home, it's done at nighttime, and what they do is they'll take this catheter. Now this catheter must be touched and dealt with in sterile procedure because that peritoneal cavity is the only thing they have to work for their kidneys. And we do not wanna introduce any infection inside your peritoneal cavity because then you don't have a kidney and then you can't filtrate all of these things that need to be coming out of that child and then the child's going to die because there's no kidney so these are things we take and we on a machine and it's a home machine 
they take and they warm this fluid and it's this diastolate, they call it. And it's whatever the nephrologist wants them to get. And there's all different types. And they hook it up to the child through this machine and they put fluid warm into the abdomen, the abdomen, the abdominal cavity, the peritoneum. And it sits there, it stills, it's called. So they put it in and it stills. It could be 100, 200 mLs, depending on the child. Put it in, let it sit for still 10, 20 minutes, whatever the doctor wants. And then they drain it for 10, 20 minutes, whatever the doctor wants. And they usually do eight to 10 cycles of this a night. So it drains into a fully catheter bag. So we know, let's say they've had 10, um, cycles of 100 mLs they put in every time. So you know that Foley bag should have 100 mLs of fluid, right? I mean, 1,000 mLs, 100 times 10 is 1,000. Now, if there's 1,800 mLs of fluid in there, we know that child at 800 mLs of urine out during the procedure, okay? Of course, then we could also weigh the child and we could see things like that and we could see the fluid coming down, but we can actually see the fluid count. Now, one of the ways that we look at these children and prevent complications is by monitoring the colors of the fluid coming out of them. Because uh, peritonitis is, you know, it's a death sentence for these children because they don't have anything else that's going to work for them. Um, so if we see the abdomen redness, tenderness, fever, we see the color change, notify the healthcare provider immediately, and then they will be ordering antibiotics um, to try to fight that infection because we need to keep that belly for dialysis. So what best describes acute gametionephritis? What is it? Anybody? Me? It is a streptococcal infection, just like rheumatic fever, right? Okay, GI. There's a lot of crazy stuff in GI when it talks about children that are not specific to adults, and some things are. One of the things that children can have is some nutritional disorders for whatever reason. It could be due to they have cancer, HIV, sickle cell, cystic fibrosis. I mean, there's reasons why kids don't get enough nutrition, why they don't grow, you know. So monitoring nutrition is so important and if they're getting all the vitamins and minerals that they do need. I mean, cystic fibrosis, we know that they don't get enough of their fat soluble vitamins, right? They don't absorb fat. So we know that'll be something to look for. Now, celiac disease is a small bowel problem, has to do with being able to tolerate foods that don't make the, um, the little celiac um, angry, okay? Um, they have this, this gluten-sensitive enteropathy, which means you can't feed them food with gluten, which is what? Wheat, rye, and barley flours. So you're talking breads, you're talking about breadings, you're talking about pastas, anything that has anything to do with breading. The only sort of breading they can have today is rice. Rice they can have, that's good stuff for them. They can have dairy, they can have fruits, they can have meats. The only thing is they have to be careful is with breading. But you know something today, if you ever go into the, whatever your supermarket is, go into the bakery, you'll see some bread gluten-free. So, I mean, they've really come a long way with it. Now, this child with celiac disease, you are going to see them have um, their stools are going to be the stinkiest things you've ever smelled because the fat goes in them. They're pale because you don't have that absorption. And you're also going to see it's stinky. And really, these children have to be watched for nutrition, nutrition. They'll be thinner children, okay? And we need to replace those fat vitamins. And there's many types of fat vitamins. Now, children 
when we feed them at six months old, we start with one food at a time every, you know, four days or six days. I mean, every physician has a different idea, but at least several days in between each introduction of foods. Now, you might have a rash that looks like that. Some kids, that's easy. I say, oh yeah, he's allergic to that. But sometimes it's a little bit more subtle. It could be just, you know, underneath the chin or in the bends of the elbows, or it could be vomiting a little more or a little bit loose stool. It could be very subtle. Um, lactose intolerance, they're vomiting, you know, where we find out that they don't like, you know, milk products, dairy. So food allergies are important to watch and um, see what happens with them. Now in GI dysfunction, many things can occur and there, it happens for many different reasons. I mean, you have a kid who's chronically spitting up, you know, reflux, spitting up. They're not getting all their nutrition, you know, and they are gonna have failure to thrive or growth failure, okay? Um, you'll see some kids with abdominal cramping and pain and distension. There are children that have a problem swallowing, this dysphagia, dysfunctional swallowing. One of the diagnoses that comes to mind when I think of that is the George syndrome. They've got a tiny mouth with a small little lower jaw and they have a really hard time eating. And many of them end up with a gastrostomy too. Uh, some of them need to be taught and they can eat, but it takes a little bit. And we know that fever is one of the things that can cause a loss of a lot of fluids. So it can cause problems too. Now, I told you dehydration can cause acute renal failure. It is a big deal. So we need to know what causes it. And then we need to know how to fix dehydration depending on why. How did it happen? What was it from? So dehydration is too much fluid out, not enough in. Could be due to many things and it can cause many different things to the child. So what do you see with a child who's dehydrated? Well, I've got two good pictures here. The picture up top, you can see the fontanelle. That's really sunken. They're sitting there. But if you look at that child a little closer, doesn't that kid look almost yellow, pale? Even the ears, the nose just look pale. A child who's dehydrated, you'll see sunken eyes on these children. You'll be able to say, oh, this kid's dehydrated. But what else is going to tell you? Well, crying with no tears is a big thing on your small infants. You see they're crying and you know they're crying, but you don't see any tears. There's a problem. Also, elevated heart rate, decreased blood pressure, prolonged capillary refill, no urine output, you know, tinting of the skin. All of these things are signs of dehydration. But I love infants with the fontanelles because you can see really quickly something's going on. So treatment. Well, treatment depends on why they're dehydrated. Children with profuse vomiting, which means you don't want to let them drink anything, will require an IV. But we need to get a basic metabolic profile. Very important, basic metabolic profile. We want to look at their electrolytes. We want to see what's going on. Then we're going to be given IV fluids. We'll most likely give an antiemetic to help them stop vomiting, give them that bolus of fluid, which is normal saline. Never ever dextrose do we bolus. Also, until an infant or child urinates, we're not going to add any potassium because we don't want to cause any renal problems. So output, intake. I mean, we can look at so many different things. I mean, children have diapers and, you know, how do we measure that urinary output? Well, we're going to look at the dry diaper minus the wet dry wet diaper, and that's going to be urine output. Gram equals an ml. Very simple of that. I mean, I think they're going to be dehydrated. I'm going to be looking at, you know, their skin turgor. I'm going to be looking at their heart rate. I'm going to be seeing, are they crying and no tears? All of these things are going to tell me something's going on um, with their intake and output. You know, diarrhea can be caused for many different things. Could be a gastroenteritis, or it could be, you know, intolerance to food. You know, they're all different stuff. So how do we treat diarrhea? 
Well, diarrhea doesn't mean they're vomiting, which means they could take oral rehydration, right? So we're gonna give them oral rehydration, whether it's Pedialyte, Power, Powerade, Gatorade, one of those things we're gonna be giving them. If they're too lethargic, really dehydrated, then of course we're gonna to go to the IV, but we're gonna feed these children. Um, usually the treatment for uh, diarrhea, three, four days long, the kid's still alert, you know, but you can see they need hydrated, give them oral. Uh, then we're gonna increase the diet and we're gonna start out with non-fat, um, bland diet, start out with maybe some crackers, uh, some oatmeal, some, you know, things that the kids like, maybe some toast, maybe um, things that they'll eat, you know, not go right to McDonald's. No, that's not going to work, but easy up and diet because we don't feed a kid. How's a diarrhea going to become solid and become a stool, right? It's not a stool um, that's getting harder. Um, if there's nothing in there, it won't get hard. So we do feed these kids. And then the last thing we do is we'll give some lactobacillus and that will replace the flora in their abdomen. Now, children get constipation. Uh, many times it's not due to any physical problem. It's usually due to something's going in in their life. Now, children can hold their stool and I've seen them hold it 10 days without stooling. And it's because maybe mom and dad got divorced. Maybe they had to move. They had to switch schools. Their best friend left. The dog died. I mean, it could be all these things. Children react to what's going on. Those psychosocial things that go on. And sometimes they cause themselves to get constipated. You know, and if they haven't stooled in seven to 10 days, we're going to, of course, give them a little, do an x-ray, look at it, and give them a little enema and get it out. And then tell the parents, you know, to give them something to help them. Miralax is the big one they love. You know, give them a little bit and get them moving. Um, and just to be aware of their environment. And if it's a chronic thing that happens, then maybe they need some somebody to talk to, right? Now I've mentioned it several times that if you have not stooled in the first day or day and a half of birth, things can be wrong and there's things to look for. You know, we've mentioned hypothyroidism already, you know, and we've mentioned cystic fibrosis. Um, and if you never knew that these were issues that they could have, this is gonna be those times where you don't know why they're constipated, that why they haven't stooled, you're gonna do an X-ray. You're gonna look at their abdomen. It could be Hirschsprung's disease. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Um, we're gonna take blood and look at their thyroid hormones and we're going to do a sweat test to check CF. And then we can find out why they're not stooling. It could be that they have a stenosis or an atresia in their intestines, or it could be due to the other things. Now, sometimes children, as they get you know, a little older, and we know it's not at right after birth, some kids have thicker stools, constipated more than others. What we have seen is that the breastfed infants tend to stool easier and more frequently. A lot of times the formula fed infants are, tend to have more um, constipation. Usually the physician will say, maybe give them a little bit of prune puree or something, even at birth, but because it will let them stool and be more natural in how we treat them. We're not gonna give them an enema every you know, other week just because they're not stooling because then the body gets used to that. Now, children can get peptic ulcers. Children are emotional and children do hold in their feelings and it can cause problems. You know, we're gonna treat a peptic ulcer in a child just like we treat it in an adult, but we're gonna give pediatric doses. So what do we do first? Well, we watch the diet. Second, maybe you'll add some pepsin, you know, and then we can add medicines in to find out what's going on. I've never seen a child need a partial gastrectomy due to a perfed uh, peptic ulcer or anything. I've never seen that. Um, usually we can treat it before it happens. 
children can have hepatitis, hepatitic, hepatitis type stuff, you know, hepatic disorders. Couldn't think of the word. It could be due to many different things. Now, the one thing that we know, if a child has hepatitis, we know, of course, we're going to wash our hands and protect ourselves and other people, other children too. We know that. But how are we going to keep that health up for that child? Because the liver is not working well. Well, the liver secretes bile. Bile digests what? Fat. So we know these children need high protein, high carbohydrates, and we have to be careful with how much fat they go in. Because if you have too much fat going in, they're going to have abdominal bloating and cramping. It's going to hurt. There'll be a lot of gas in that belly. So hepatic disorders, that's what we do. Now, I mentioned Hirschsprung. It's one of those things that you most likely uh, at birth will not see a child stooling, but you might see a little tiny little ribbon of a stool. I mean, think about taking and icing a cake and you take that little thing that you push and you can like squirt little cute little things or little flowers, that little ribbon looking thing. That's the sort of stool you might see. If you look at the picture and that bottom where the rectum is sticking down, it's tiny and you might see little ribbon stools coming out. But that big outpatching thing has no nerves in it, which means there's no peristalsis. Things are collecting and it's getting bigger and bigger, but it doesn't hurt because there's no nerves in there. So how do we treat this? We are going to do an x-ray. We're going to find it. We're going to do a biopsy, find no nerves. We're going to do surgery and take, you know, the whole big piece of bowel out that's not working. And then we're going to probably, this child's going to end up with a colostomy for a couple months. And then most of the time they do repair it and put it end to end. So Hirschsprungs, there's no nerves. They don't feel it. And one of the symptoms is either no stool or ribbon stools. Acute appendicitis. Well, we know what appendicitis is in adults, right? The McDerney point, that's the right lower quadrant pain, rebound tenderness, okay? Yes, same thing in kids. Now, treatment, you know, surgery for sure. Children who get to surgery quick enough that don't rupture are usually home. Uh, if it's done in the morning, they can go home at night. Or if it's done later on in the afternoon, they'll go home the next morning. They get them up and out really quick because that's the most important thing. They do better at home. But sometimes the parents waited too long or the kid didn't tell the parents and therefore it was late getting to the emergency room. And they finally get to the ER and they go, oh, mom, the pain's gone. Well, usually that's the ruptured appendix. So how do we treat a ruptured appendix post-op? Well, if that appendix bursts in the abdomen, you're going to have bad peritonitis. It means it, the whole peritoneum is all inflamed. The intestines has all of this caustic, you know, materials that has, you know, touched it. And it's angry, it's red, and it's mad. So we treat these children by... They don't need anything going in their, their mouth and through their GI tract, so their NPO. Also, their gastric juices constantly are being secreted, and that acid in the gastric juices can really upset the GI tract. So we put in an NG tube, low suction, get rid of those GI um, those juices so it doesn't uh, hurt the uh, belly and the intestines and you know can aid in letting it heal. These children will be on IV fluids and priority care is antibiotics on these children to fight the infection and giving them pain control. I mean, we'll be watching their lab values because we have an NG tube sucking out electrolytes, also their NPO, so we want to make sure electrolytes are good. Um, the other thing, we are going to be um, looking at where the surgical site was. Because it burst inside the belly, was the tissue that they connected back together again, was it healthy? Because it can burst, it can dehiss. So we need to monitor their wound. 
They need their pain control. They need to be up. They need to be out of bed, coughing, deep breathing, instead of spirometry um, in order to try to heal. But they'll be NPO for several days until we start hearing some good bowel sounds. Then we will stop the NG tubes, see how they feel, start clear liquids and increase diet as they go. Now, a thing that happens to children, only children, is called intussusception. It's where you take the intestines and one piece sucks up into the other, like a telescope, intussusception. What happens? These kids is a very distinctive child. You'll see a kid being held by the parents and their legs are gonna be flailing and you touch their belly and it's rigid and they're in pain. Now, sometimes, it goes in, the pain occurs, and then just by itself, it comes back apart and the pain stops and they're running around the room. And you're like, okay, the kid's fine now. Well, if we can, we get the child over to um, ultrasound when they're in pain and we could see that the telescoping of that intestines, one inside the other. What is treatment? Well, we put them on a high fiber diet so that it keeps that intestinal tract moving along. Um, usually that's what happens and they resolve by themselves. But on a rare occasion that gets sucked up inside the other one and it gets swollen and you can't separate it. Uh, so these children will need to have surgery and have that piece of bowel removed. So then it's a surgical colectomy, right? It's a piece of intestines removed. And then of course, post-op care is going to be, you know, NPO until bowel sounds, IV, IV antibiotics, pain control, up out of bed, coughing, deep breathing and all that, what you do post-op. Now, mechal diverticulum, it's not that common, but it is a child in the small bowel, like the lower, you know, almost the whole, almost to the large intestines, there is this, what we call a mesenteric duct, and it's a, a diverticula, it's like an outpatching, but in this outpatching of skin is this big blood vessel, and it tears, so it bleeds quite a bit into the intestines, and you will see a child that's bleeding blood out of its rectum, but he doesn't really hurt. He might have a little bit of abdominal tenderness, but really not much at all, okay? So painless rectal bleeding. How do we take care of it? It needs surgery. We need to go in, take that piece of tissue out, clamp that vessel, um, and the kids do really well. IBS or inflammatory bowel disease. It's, you know, either that IBS or it's ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. Um, IBS, mouth to anus, the whole GI tract. Ulcerative colitis, Crohn's are pieces of the intestines that tend to get upset. Basically with these children, they complain of abdominal pain. Um, they're usually children um, that are afraid to eat because of the way that their um, tummies hurt. These children need to be on a special diet that um, is easy on their abdomen. Uh, we treat them medically with steroids. Sometimes they need to go on biologics, you know, Humira or Embril or an infusion, you know, that can help them stop the body from eating itself like an ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. You know, and it does help these children, but it's nutrition and it's, you know, the medicines which help these children do well. Uh, sometimes they've got to go to surgery and get pieces of their bowel removed, um, depending uh, if they can't manage it with a medical. Now, short bowel syndrome, it's very hard to describe, but I'm going to give you a scenario. Little Jessica was six months old. She had... Uh, cardiac surgery, her second stage, and she had a prolonged uh, time on a ventilator trying to get off. Very rough course, but it had gone on for a while. So, you know, with children, we always worry about nutrition. So we ended up sticking a tube in her nose that went down into her duodenum. It's called an ND tube. And we gave slow a little bit of formula down into this for nutrition, to keep the bowels moving and to give nutrition. Well, the bowels reacted to it, got inflamed, 
and she got something called necrotizing endocolitis. Basically, her bowel died. We, I mean, what I describe it as is a hypoxic bowel that can't tolerate uh, food in there. And then it just completely dies off because it doesn't know what to do with that food. Well, her small intestines, they had to remove 52 centimeters of it, which is almost like 80% of it. What does the small intestines do? Doesn't it do all the absorption of nutrition? And so she really had a problem with short bowel syndrome, which is all nutritional, right? There was not enough bowel to get all the nutrition that she needed. Well, just like this little boy, he has a Broviac tube in the IV, that's a Broviac central line at nighttime, just like him, I'm sure, got hyperalimentation and lipids when she slept. And then during the day, they would give her through the gastrostomy tube food so that she had enough nutrition um, so she could grow. So short bowel syndrome, the whole big thing is all about nutrition and not enough area for the body to absorb nutrition, okay? Now there's two other things that can occur um, with the, the abdomen. It's called a midline defect, which means the midline of the abdomen closes up. Sometimes the stomach is on the outside when it closes. And the stomach, they're, they're born with the stomach on the outside, which is called a gastroschisis, okay? These children, they're born and you'll see this big, you'll see the big blob sitting there. So our goal as nurses is to pour, put a sterile towel on it, keep it you know, sterile as we can, prevent infections. And then surgery comes and slowly tucks it in and then ends up closing it. Well, this also can happen with the urinary bladder called bladder extrophy. Same thing. It happens during their embryonic development. The, the abdomen closes, so there should be skin over it, but the bladder's sitting out. And the bladder is still working, still producing urine, still holding it, but it's on the outside of the body. And again, slowly tuck it in and then we close it up. And most of these kids do well. I've seen many gastroschisis and they do well, but they're gonna end up with a you know, um, suture line you know, on their belly. Hernias, there's all sorts of hernias. I think when we think of children, we think of their belly buttons, you know, and these little squishy things you can push in and out. And the, the umbilical hernia, very common in children, especially your premature children, you see a lot of them. And um, the thing is when you can put your finger in and out, they're called reducible, they're fine, they're benign. And you, you, know, you can fix them or not. Um, the reason to fix them is um, for you don't want it sticking out and you don't want it to get incarcerated or strangulated. When you have that umbilical hernia and you touch it, it's hard, it's painful. You can't put it back in that is incarcerated, strangulated. And it is a surgical emergency. Uh, the other sort of hernia is a diaphragmatic hernia. And that's, you know, the diaphragm, what does it do? It holds lungs up and keeps the intestines down, right? So if there's a hole, the intestines go up and it goes up the left side of the chest. It goes up during the embryonic sort of stages. So your intestines are up in the chest and that left lung cannot form. So you only have a right lung but it pushes over on that right lung too. So at birth, you have a minimal place for that kid to be able to oxygenate, pushes it. This kid is a sick kid. This kid at birth, you cannot ventilate, you cannot oxygenate these children because it's a small little right lung that's being compressed by intestines. These children usually end up on ECMO, which is like a uh, heart lung. Um, and it basically just produces oxygen and it circulates oxygen for that child because their lungs cannot do the job. When the kid's stable enough, they will take and bring the intestines down and put a mesh there and hold it down. But for life, they're only gonna have a right lung. They'll never have a left. It'll be a bud there. It won't be there. Malrotation and volvulus. 
these are conditions that happen where the malrotation is the intestines goes around the mesenteric artery and then it pinches it off, stops blood supply, which will cause death of an intestinal area and will cause pain and it could cause peritonitis. Um, usually they come in with pain in weird places like the left upper abdomen, which, you know, what else could that be? And then we'll do an ultrasound, look for it. Volvulus, it tends to twist and sometimes go into a knot. Again, not getting blood supply, therefore it dies the, the, the uh, intestines and can cause again the peritonitis and perforation. Treatment, well, we do the ultrasound, we find it, we stop feeding them, start an IV, get them to surgery, and we'll remove those defects. Now at birth in OB, they told you the first thing you do for a newborn infant is take a rectal temp. And they tell you it's because you want an accurate temperature, but they're making sure this child has an anus. If you look at that picture of that little infant there, the kid does not have an anus. It's called an imperforated anus. There is none. It's an emergency. It's a surgical emergency because you still have all those secretions in the GI tract. Where is it going to go? So we need to put a colostomy and this child will have a colostomy forever. The other things with the GI tract and, you know, the, you know, talking about, you know, the, the vagina and the bladder and the um, intestine, sometimes there's connections in there called fistulas. I've seen stool coming out of vaginas. I've seen urine coming out of intestines. And these things need to be fixed as soon as we can to prevent infections. Now, vomiting. There, there's a couple different sort of vomitings um, that we'll talk about. We have those refluxes we've talked about. We have vomiting. We have something called pyloric stenosis. Now, vomiting is that little spit up. It's usually dribble. You know, sometimes it will come out, but just, you know, it'll just come out, not forceful across the room. If a child is vomiting, you know, and is vomiting and now showing signs of dehydration. We need to, number one, NPO. We need to do a metabolic profile. Again, I want electrolytes. What's going on with the kid? What's the status of the dehydration? And we're going to start an IV and give a bolus of IV fluid with saline. We never, ever bolus with sugar and we never start potassium until an infant does um, void, okay? But vomiting, we're gonna give IV fluids because you give them more something by mouth, they're gonna vomit again. We know children ingest everything, you know, and you might, they can, might come in and they're vomiting because of that. Um, remember, we need to teach our parents to have um, poison control numbers, you know, dialed into their phones so that in case of problems. I think the biggest thing I've seen children uh, love to get into is their vitamins because they're good. You know, Flintstone gummy bears, they're, they're amazing. And they just chew them, chew them, chew them. And actually it doesn't harm them. It really doesn't. The body will get rid of extra, you know, vitamins they don't need unless it's with iron. Now, iron could be the problem, right? Um, the other thing I like to get into is their like chewable Tylenol. They like to chew on them. And we know then acetaminophen, Tylenol is liver toxic. So that child's gonna be in danger. Another thing they like to do, some children as they're getting older, is the windowsills and older buildings, they stick out and they like to sit and chew on them. And the paint could have lead in it in older places. Um, if they chew it too much and it's in an older building, they can get lead poisoning. So then they'll need that, what we call chelation therapy, whether medication or an apheresis machine. Okay, gastroesophageal reflux means the stomach is spewing stuff back up the esophagus and burning the esophagus and can cause also aspiration pneumonia. So what do we do for this? Well, number one, we try with infants thicken their food a little bit, sit them up, burp them well, don't overfeed them, you know, all of those things. If that doesn't work um, and the kid is not gaining weight and it's continuing no matter what we do, they might 
decide, and a lot of times we do this also for older children that we can't control, is we'll do something called a Nissan fundal plication. A Nissan fundal plication is basically they take the upper portion of the stomach and they kink it so that the food can't go up it and they just stitch it in place. You will see if you have even adults getting a gastrostomy tube put in, they'll do a gastrostomy tube with a fundal plication. It's because we don't want the food, we dump their feeds into their stomach, we don't want it go right up into their lungs. Now, sometimes gastroesophageal reflux we see in an older child. But older child's gonna show you symptoms. An infant, you're gonna see them arch their back. I mean, it's very clear. They arch their back, you know that they're refluxing. In an older child, they'll complain of that burning in their chest, heartburn, but because they're partially aspirating, they'll be coughing. Because if you're going to something trying to get in your lungs, what do you do? You cough, you cough, you cough. Again, um, treatment would be if they can't manage it medically, they'll go in and do the Nissan fundal plication. Now, the other type of vomiting. Now, I used to, uh, on children, two months and less. They come in, mom saying they're vomiting. I will ask them, is it dribble or does it shoot across the room? Now, if they tell me it's dribbling, I know that's more of a GERD. You know, that's a little bit of vomiting, which we can treat in many different ways. You know, burping better, sitting up, maybe thick in the, the um, food, something. But across the room, this is something that we call a hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Well, there's a pyloric valve that empties into the small uh, intestines and it gets thickened and muscular and very small stenosis, right? Narrowing. And it can't get through there. So the belly gets big. They drink, drink, drink. Belly gets big and all of a sudden, the whole contents spews forcefully, and I'm talking across the room. If you're 10, 20 feet away, let me tell you, it will hit your feet. My son had that. And he was shooting across the floor, wasn't he? Yes. So what do we do for this? Make them NPO. I mean, these kids are eating, they're hungry, they're hungry and poof across the room and they're screaming, they're hungry and you feed them more and poof across the room. It's, it's quite, they're not getting any nutrition because it can't go down. So make them NPO, give them an IV, they go to surgery. They take and they open that little muscle that's hypertrophic, that is thickened, and they will open it and let it go down. These children do well. They're usually the next day, they'll start feeding them clear liquids, um, and then they'll get them home in a day or two pretty quickly on these kids. Now, when I see a kid and the mother tells me they're shooting across the room, I take my hand and usually they're held by the parents and I will touch like right below their symphysis pubis, um, the, the xiphoid process, you know, right underneath their uh, rib cage. And you can actually feel a little marble or a little, it's called an olive size mass. And you're like, yeah, this is pyloric stenosis. These kids do well. There's no problem with them. There's no long-term recovery with them. They, once they open that pyloric valve, they do really well. And then they're gonna eat and be satisfied because they're not getting nutrition before. They were angry, they were hungry and they couldn't get food, poor little things. Cleft lip. Cleft lip, sometimes children are born with one side, both sides, uh, sometimes the palate also. Um, and we don't know why, they just don't close. When they're born, uh, remember, what do children do and how do they relieve stress in themselves? It's all their mouth, right? It's all oral. Um, and if they don't have closure, they can't suck well, can they? Because there's no closure here or in the palate, they can't. So we try to close this lip, the lip first, um, about two to three months. And they try to approximate it plastically to make sure there's not a crooked lip when you get older. Okay, very important that they do that. 
And then they'll put this little bar there called a Logan bar or a Logan bow. And what it does is when they're moving and smushing their face, they can't smush their lip and open up their sutures. Now, could look like any of these pictures. Now you have the palette. The palette's not done till later, okay? It's a little bit more of a process, but we try to do it before they start talking. So six to 12 months, because if you cannot have a palette or the lips correct, your pronunciation is not gonna be good because you can't make those sounds. So it will affect their speech if it's not done. So these kids, they do the lip because it makes it content, they can self smooth. And then by year, so they can talk and they're gonna have speech problems. Now, look at this cute little bottle here. So you're saying two to three months, how are they gonna eat? Now, women who want to breastfeed, I admire them. It's a very difficult thing to do. I mean, they can give breast milk and put it in a bottle, but many women say, no, I still want the comfort of that in the breastfeeding. Well, literally they have to hold the baby and actually squeeze their breast to get milk out as they're trying to have this baby suck to give that baby comfort. If the, they can't do that, and many times the women just, I, I can't do anymore, it's exhausting. They can use this bottle called a Haberman bottle. And that top is really soft and the nipple soft. And when you turn it over with the milk in it, you can slowly squeeze it as they're trying to, and you can see them try to suck and you can have them drink and do really, really well that well. Because if they're not getting enough food and on breastfeeding, they could tire out really easy. They don't get nutrition, what happens? Well, they're not going to grow well. Cognitively, they could be delayed. So nutrition is our important thing with these kids. And the last thing for today is esophageal atresia or tracheoesophageal fistula. Well, esophageal atresia, A without. Oh, it doesn't connect to the stomach. The esophagus is a tube and it's not connected. So they eat, it goes down to the esophagus, comes up and they'll probably aspirate it because they're gonna vomit. So we do not feed these kids. Or they have a connection between the trachea and the esophagus. So they eat, goes down the esophagus, goes over the fistula, right into the lungs. So they're aspirating. So what do we do for these children? Well, number one, we do not want um, anything to be aspirated. So NPO, all right, nothing to eat or drink. These children elevate the head of their bed and have suction available. These children are normal kids, but they need to connect the esophagus to the stomach if that's the case, or they need to remove that fistula so that we can get food going down and not coming back up into the trachea. Because preoperatively, no matter how good you are, you still have mucus going down, they're still swallowing, they're still having little mini aspirations. So preoperatively, they're gonna be on IV fluids because they can't eat, but they'll be getting antibiotics because they are aspirating and it can cause aspiration pneumonia. A lot of stuff, huh? GI is crazy. I mean, there's things with GU, but I think GI is probably the craziest of all the systems of the body, which has so much to do when they're pediatrics. So who wants to win the cahoots today? Yeah, Brian, I know you do. You always do. How about Brianna? Yes. My, my blippy girl. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Here we go. I had my grandson this past weekend. I love having him around. Here we go. One, nine, seven. Seven two six.
197 726. <laughs> That's cute. G I G U. A multi select. All the following are symptoms of dehydration in an infant. When you see a child who's dehydrated, we're going to see a decrease urine output or none, dry pale skin, weak lethargic, their skin is not gonna be elastic, prolonged capillary refill, crying with no tears, elevated heart rate, decreased blood pressure. I mean, you could see sunken fontanelles. There's so many symptoms you can see with them. So depending on how bad the dehydration is, it's gonna depend on what treatment you're gonna do for them. What is priority treatment for a child with dehydration due to profuse vomiting? How are you gonna treat this kid? Remember dehydration in children, we need to treat it. It is priority care to treat it. <clears throat> So if we are vomiting, we do not want to give anything by mouth because they'll just continue to vomit. We want to give IV fluids. We want a metabolic profile. We want to know where we're starting with, with dehydration and we're going to give an antiemetic. And then once we've given and gotten the dehydration, get the heart rate back down and get them a little bit wetter, as I would call it, then we'll start introducing some PO electrolyte fluids. What is the treatment for an infant with diarrhea lasting for four days? <clears throat> if you have a kid with diarrhea, Unless they are lethargic and you know not with you, we're going to give them PO fluid, okay? Because they're having diarrhea, they're not vomiting. We can give those fluids by uh, Pedialyte, Powerade, Gatorade, we can do that. And then of course, introduce back their diet so we can make the diarrhea thicken it up, you know, with some substance, some sort of food that's going in. IV fluids is only for that child who is vomiting because you don't want to give fluids to a vomiting child. Diarrhea, you can give PO fluids. <clears throat> what acid base imbalance may you see with a child that's having profuse diarrhea? Now remember, I told you there's about four questions on acid base on your HESI. That's why I'm keeping throwing these in during my cahoots. <clears throat> The answer is acidosis. And I'm going to tell you why the metabolic. When you have diarrhea, because of the amount of um, enzymes that are used for digestion, they're all alkalotic. So you are losing alkalotic fluids with diarrhea. So you're left with acid. Now, if you're vomiting, you're vomiting gastric acid. So you'd be in metabolic alkalosis. Remember that. That's the way I remember. Acid out the top, which will be alkalosis and alkaline out of the bottom, and you'll be in what? The acidosis. So that's the difference. A multi-select. An infant has not passed the meconium stool in the first 24 to 36 hours. What would you assess for? <clears throat>
Well, hypothyroidism and cystic fibrosis are those two diagnoses that many times are only diagnosed they didn't know at first because they didn't stool. Remember Hirschsprungs, there is no, it's like an aganglionic, no nerves. There might be a tiny ribbon stool, but usually nothing. And electrolytes has nothing to do with meconium stools at all. A deficiency of vitamin D causes. Vitamin D does what? It helps with bones. So which one of these is deficiency related to bones? <clears throat> And it's rickets, good job. Scurvy is vitamin C. That's like the old um, sailors. They used to take um, oranges on the boats because they used to get scurvy. I remember that from school from, I don't know how long ago. A multi-select. What treatment can a nurse anticipate to a child unable to eat or drink anything with profuse vomiting and diarrhea? A child's unable to drink or eat anything with profuse vomiting and diarrhea. What are you going to do? I bet you that child feels horrible. We are going to get that basic metabolic profile. Yes. And we're going to give IV fluids. They're profusely vomiting. Nothing by mouth. And I'm sure we're going to be given an anti-medic for that part. And they'll go home and we'll tell them to give some probiotics. A multi-select. What nursing management would you anticipate for a child with a ruptured appendix post-operatively? So we know if the appendix ruptured, they have peritonitis. So we're going to give IV um, antibiotics for the infection. We want that NG tube suction because we want the bowel emptied because it's angry, it's upset. It's been spewed with that appendix contents. And then we don't know if that surgical site is healthy. So we're gonna assess it. Complete bed rest, no. Out of bed, sitting in a chair, ambulating. Of course, after pain medicine, prevention of pulmonary complications and um, blood clots, it's like you would do with an adult. Children can get those complications. <clears throat> Passage of urine, usually at night, in children who should have voluntary bladder control. <clears throat> it's called enuritis, enuresis. Now there's two things here that I didn't cover on the PowerPoint I'm gonna talk about right now. And that's epispadius and hypospadius. When you have a penis, you have your urethra and urine comes out the tip. In epispadius, it doesn't come out the tip, it comes out from the top, okay? Hypospadius, again, not out the tip, it comes out the bottom. So how do we treat this? Well, before they are potty trained, we have a child, you cannot circumcise these children. And this is very difficult in the Jewish faith because they wanna do their brisk, they can't. They use that skin for a plastic closure. Now, because they wanna keep the maintenance and the lumen open, they put a catheter in there and they leave it in there and send it home. And we don't do anything with it. We just put it in the diaper. It helps keep the lumen open, keeps the patency and allows urine to go. And these kids do great. They do really good. And you know they'll have be urinating the way they should. So epispadius and hypospadius on top or on bottom. I've seen hypospadius most of the time. What is Hirschsprung's disease? <clears throat> 
Well, we know Hirschsprung's disease is gonna end up with a colostomy like the picture. It's that big outpatching of that um, aganglionous um, sort of stool, which means there's a bowel. There is no nerve. So it stretches and it sits there and they have to remove it. What types of stools would an infant with Hirschsprung's disease have? So these children, there's like a little tiny little um, area and sometimes a little bit of stool gets down there and they're ribbon shaped. It's either no stools or ribbon shaped, but if they had a stool, it'd be ribbon shaped. Which is a condition that occurs mainly in children where the intestines telescope into itself. They suck up into each other, causing intense pain usually three months to three years. I mostly see it in the two to three year olds. <clears throat> and they're screaming, they're in so much pain. And then all of a sudden they're not because it pops back out and it's called intussusception. Usually treatment, they usually you know correct by themselves. We increase fiber in their diet, but if not, they need to go to surgery and they can cut out that piece of intestines. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD. What's that? And that's when the stomach, it just reflux up down in the esophagus. And then of course there's many aspirations on these things and we have to be very careful about that. How do we prevent GERD in an infant? Well, you put a little bit of rice cereal in their formula. I mean, the rice cereal, they don't dissolve or use, but it thickens you know, the formula or the milk and it holds it down. Plus we burp them good, we sit them up after feeds and we don't overfeed them. And that's the treatment. And then sometimes we might add on some Pepsid. Inflammatory bowel disease, IBS involves what? <clears throat> it's mouth to anus, anywhere on the intestinal tract. What would the nurse be looking for with a patient with mechal diverticulum? <clears throat> Oh, shit. So mechal diverticulum, remember that little diverticuli has ripped and this big blood vessel is putting blood down in the intestines. So usually it's painless rectal bleeding. And what do we treat it with? Surgery, remove that diverticuli. A six-year-old child goes to the ER due to abdominal pain, fever and vomiting for the last day. What assessment is priority? Like, what do you need to know about this child? What's the first thing you need to know? I wanna know where the abdominal pain is. What sort of emergency am I dealing with here? Is this, you know, abdominal pain? Is it an appendix? Is it intersusception? Is it maybe, um, some sort of obstruction, we can tell by where is that pain? Tell me where is that? Very important information. What would the nurse expect to see in an infant with biliary atresia? Well, biliary atresia, A, without nothing, which means there's no connection between the liver and the common bile duct. So no bile is going into the common bile duct and it's not there for digestion. And it's not in the GI tract. 
So you're gonna see clay colored stools, abdominal distension. You might even see tea colored urine in these children. These children need surgery to open up a connection between the liver and the common bile duct because the liver is just gonna con continue to secrete the bile is gonna go into the system and it can become toxic. So it needs surgery. What structure of the mouth can be impacted by cleft lip and cleft palate? <clears throat> All of the above, lip, palate, uh, soft palate, and soft palate's in the back and it can go all the way back there. Cleft lip repair is typically done when? <laughs> No, when you think of a lip, you know, these children want to suck on something. They want to self-soothe. So we need to repair these when? As soon as we can, right? Two to three months is a good time because they explore the world through their mouths. They self-soothe through their mouths. We want them to have their lip fixed so that they can do those things. When does a cleft palate repair typically occur? Now we know it's done after the lip. And that's usually around six to 12 months um, that we um, do that one also. Remember, we need to repair it as soon as we can because of the chances of problems with speech. And if they can't get it fixed right, they're gonna have speech impediments. Esophageal atresia, hmm, what's that? And that's when you have no connection between the esophagus and the stomach. Atresia, remember, without no opening. What are the classic signs of esophageal atresia and tracheal esophageal fistula? Remember, these children, there's no connection between their stomach. There's connections between the bronchus, um, trachea, and the esophagus. And they have all of this aspiration going on in there. What would you see? They're going to be uh, choking and gagging and turning blue because you know, it keeps going into their lungs. So these children, NPO, head of the bed up and we're gonna have suction at the bedside. And we're gonna be giving them IVs and IV antibiotics before they go to surgery because they're constantly aspirating. A multi-select. Neonate suspected tracheal esophageal fistula. Nursing care should include what? <clears throat> <clears throat> NPO, elevate the head of their bed. We're gonna give IV fluids and antibiotics. Elevating the head for feeding, what are we gonna feed? Right into the lungs if we fed. So no, we're not gonna feed these children. A five-year-old child is complaining of epigastric pain and a persistent cough. What would you suspect? <clears throat> you know, we're having that reflux from the stomach going up the esophagus and some of this contents is going into their lungs. So they're having these little aspiration moments. It hurts. I mean, infants, they arch their back so big when you can see them, you go, this kid is refluxing, you can feel it. The kid just arches with it. And then these children have that pain in their cough, 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 because, you know, food is going into their lungs. Signs and symptoms of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis.
cell, we're going to feel that little hypertrophic pyloric valve thicken. You can feel that right below um, the rib cage, right in the middle, a little bit to the right. And signs and symptoms of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. <clears throat> So remember, these kids are projectile vomiting. They are hungry. They want to eat. They keep vomiting. So their food keeps going. They're never satisfied. So they've got a great appetite, but they're projectile vomiting across the room. Preoperative treatment of pyloric stenosis include... <laughs> We're going to keep that child NPO because it can't go down. It's just going to be vomiting again. And we're going to start IV fluids. Excellent. Good job. What does the celiac disease affect? <clears throat> Remember, celiac disease is small intestines where the digestion is done. That's why we can't get any fat vitamins that are lost. Remember, all the absorption of food, small intestines. If you have celiac disease, what should you eliminate from your diet? <clears throat> No wheat, no rye, no barley. They can have rice, they can have dairy, they can have meats, they can have fruits, um, but no wheat, rye, or barley. So be careful with bread stuff. A multi-select. Vitamins that children with celiac disease are prone to lose are? A, D, and K. Vitamin C is a water-soluble vitamin. And these are replaced. They do give vitamin supplements. What foods would you select for a child with celiac disease? So what do they have to be careful with? They have to be careful with wheat, rye, and barley. Those are types of flours. So we're going to give them that omelet. You know, fish sticks, macaroni, fish sticks are breaded. Nope, they can't have it. Macaroni and cheese, that macaroni, those pasta. Nope, probably it's going to be some sort of flour. So those two, no, that one, no. But an omelet, milk, fruit, yes. Mimosis, what is it? I mentioned this when I talked about urinary tract infections and the male. <clears throat> and it's when it's really, really too tight, you can't pull it down, you know, and they should be pulled down once a day and cleaned. What is a hydrocele? Hydrocele is when there's fluid in the testicles and it is painful. And sometimes the symptoms are, you know, an older child who gets incontinent with pain in the testicle and the treatment is antibiotics, usually a shot of rocephin and PO antibiotics. What is crypto orchidism? It's another thing I didn't see in the PowerPoint, um, but I mentioned it here so that you know what it is.
So crypto orchidism is when the testicles do not come down into the scrotal sac. Um, the thing about males, when we examine them, make sure that they're in a room that's not too cold. It should be warm because males, when it's cold, they tend to shrink up and we want to get a real examination, a good assessment. So have them in a warm room so that you'll have the testicles where you need to see. And they will do surgery to bring them down if they don't come down because they don't like to be up in the abdominal cavity because it will you know, kill the uh, testicle. They don't like that warmth. So you suspect an infant with a crypto orchidism. How would you examine that child? <laughs> I mean, it's one of the first things that a pediatrician does on a male uh, baby is to make sure they have their testicles. Yes, have them in a nice warm room. A hypospadias is. So hypospadias is that opening on the underside or the ventral side of the penis. The epispadias is on the dorsal side. A multi-select. How is a hypospadias corrected? So they get the foreskin, that's why they can't be circumcised. They will cover it and they put that stint in there. This is done under general anesthesia. It's quite a big surgery and local, an infant or a child who's a year old will not tolerate that. So they do general anesthesia. What is bladder extrophy? It's that thing that happens when it's on the outside. So it's that midline closure that happens during their development and the bladder is on the top of the abdomen because the midline doesn't close. Again, the bladder is fine, it works fine. What are the clinical manifestations of nephrotic syndrome? <laughs> Remember, it is not renal failure, nothing to do with renal failure. The kidneys work. It all has to do with getting rid of protein. Say protein, yuck, I don't like you, and gets rid of it, but rid of it from every place. And we know the signs and symptoms are big and swollen and our clinical care, low, uh, low salt and restricting fluids and daily weights are your priority. Children with nephrotic syndrome are often given what medications for fluid overload. Well, remember, intervascularly, they have no proteins. So we know that their fluid is going inter extracellular and swelling, the edema occurs. So to pull the fluids back in, we put more protein in there, which is the albumin. Then we give Lasix and it flushes it out. Very good. That's a huge concept right there. What is used to treat nephrotic syndrome in children? It's prednisone, okay? We give the prednisone, that's why they're immunosuppressed and we have to watch out for infections. A child is admitted with acute glomerular nephritis. Which recent illness could validate this finding?
Remember, glomerulonephritis is like rheumatic fever. It is caused by a strep throat. So if we know this child just got over having a sore throat, we know that this could possibly be the reason why they have acute glomerulonephritis. What is priority nursing care of a child with nephrotic syndrome? What do you need to do for this child? Priority. Monitor daily weights. You know, we are going to be um, decreasing salt and monitoring fluid intake, but our job monitoring uh, daily weights intake and output be the other. Why is erythropoietin used in chronic kidney failure? What is that stuff? <clears throat> and we know erythropoietin stimulates the body to produce red blood cells. And hopefully we're gonna have decreased blood transfusions because the body's doing its own job. A multi-select. Children with chronic kidney disease can have renal osteodystrophy. What can this do to the child? So chronic kidney disease can cause problems with vitamin D can cause problems with your calcium. And that's the parathyroid stuff. It could cause because it's osteo bones, problems with the bones, and then they're not growing the way they should. So you're not going to grow as tall. So growth retardation, nothing to do with uric acid. A diagnostic finding of acute glomerulonephritis could be So when you think about acute glomerulonephritis, we know it could be caused by a strep infection. So a positive ASO titer would say, yes, this child's had a strep infection. So ASO titer, another way of saying they had pharyngitis, right? Which complication of peritoneal dialysis is the most important? We don't want to have it. We want to prevent it. And that's peritonitis. Remember, peritoneal dialysis depends on the peritoneum to be able to be its kidney. If it's infected, it's not going to work. So the most important complication to prevent is abdominal peritonitis. What clinical assessment is most important to report with a child diagnosed with an acute kidney trauma? You know, I had a kid, I think it was nine years old playing tag or something. And he was running around and he turned and he hit the trailer hitch right at the side of the left kidney. Huge ecumenic area came into the ER. And what I saw, his potassium was seven something. He had a huge um, kidney trauma. But yes, watching potassium, kidneys, and you think potassium, they go hand in hand, don't they? Multi-select. What should the nurse anticipate for a child who just had a renal biopsy? So we're going to monitor their urinating. We're going to look at the dressing. We're going to look at their belly because we don't want that urine to leak out or into the belly and their bed rest 24 hours to prevent um, that dressing from the clot to come off. 
We're gonna have a sandbag there. As I said, very similar to your cardiac calf. What would you do if fluid draining from the peritoneal dialysis has changed color and it's now cloudy? Something's going on. It could be an infection. We're going to call the doctor and we are going to anticipate antibiotics, but we can't give antibiotics until we call the doctor. That's why doctors first. Last question. What would the nurse provide to an infant that cannot eat normally? You know, these children, they're made NPO, like, you know, your tracheal esophageal fistula. They can't eat, but there are some certain developmental things that they need to do. And we wanna keep that sucking. We want that pacifier, non-nutritive sucking because that's how they self-soothe. That's how they explore the world. We want to keep that there so that when they can eat, they're already there. They've already been doing it by the pacifier. Good job, guys. Number three, Abby. Good job, Abby. Number two, Jen. Number one, I told you. Here she goes. Good job, guys. That was a hard one. T N. Look at that. Big bucks B. <laughs> Good job, guys. What I want you to do is sign your attendance attestations. Make sure they're done. Um, and remember, if you want me to look at your projects, send them out soon so I can do it and send them back and you could get the best grade you possibly can. So thank you guys, another nice class. Appreciate y'all, have a good evening.